Our next speaker, I'm very happy to have him because he called in only last week and asked, could you speak at the GoDev room, please? Uh, because we had a cancelled talk. Uh, apparently, immigration out of the UK is a problem post-Brexit. Um, and he said yes. And why did I call him? Because last year, he also had to say no to me. And he promised me to give a talk. And he's going to give the same talk he promised to me last year, which is basically, I quit a well-paid job at Google, and here's why. Round of applause to Filippo. Thank you. The good news is that this is a much better talk than I would have given a year ago. Because a year ago, I had no idea if this was going to work. I have good news. Anyway, uh, first, uh, a bit about me. I'm Filippo Valsorda. I've been the maintainer of the Go Cryptography standard library uh, about since 2018. And that's a job I've shared over the years with Katie Hockman, Roland Schumacher, Damian Neal, Nicola Murino, and many others, to be clear. I was uh, doing that at Google until 2022. So I was on the, on the Go team. Uh, uh, the title I had was uh, lead of the Go security team. Uh, and that's the team that did things, including the fuzzing support that uh, we were talking about earlier. Until 2022. Uh, because in 2022, I left pretty much to prove a point about s proving that something was possible. And the something was, uh, was actually, let me tell you a story first. Uh, stop me if you heard it. Uh, you're maintaining an uh, open source project, and uh, the, that open source project has two kinds of maintainers. Some are volunteers, so you don't really feel like you can ask any hard commitment of them, right? You can tell them, well, I mean, uh, Alice, uh, you really told me that you were going to fix CI. Why isn't it fixed? Well, Alice will respond, because you don't pay me. And what do you say to that? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> yes, exactly. T -t -thank, you for, thank you for your help. Uh, and the alternative is you are employed full time uh, at a company. And that company is a reality of capitalist society, uh, which I say with no value judgment there. And that company has an interest in making money and has an interest in not spending money that will not make money because that's what a company is and does. And that company will maybe start a project because it has a bunch of uh, value for uh, recruitment and for internal infrastructure. And it will fund uh, some maintainers because it goes like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is a good project. We should uh, make it into existence. And that's great. That's the company contributing something to the world and we should appreciate that. Then the project grows. Now, does the value of that project to that company grow? Not really. So the number of users double, and then double, and then double, and then double. Uh, and they start filling rooms and uh, conferences, and that's great. Uh, and do you think the number of people working on that project, fully paid by a company, grow? They do not. And some people get angry at the company, and they think that's misplaced, because why should uh, a company say, oh, yes, this is more useful to the world, so we should uh, sink a lot more money into it? I mean, hey, if it was my money, sure. But you're a manager at a company, it's not your money, it's the shareholder's money, it's not really even a thing you can do. So now you have a problem, because success of the project puts the project in a difficult position. And I said, stop me if you know this one, because this is not a rant about Go. This is not about Google. This is not about any specific case. If I had seen this only once, I wouldn't have said, well, this kind of needs a, uh, a fix. Uh, this is something I've heard over and over and over again, uh, all over the industry, all over the past 10 years, uh, all over uh, different companies. Because this is fundamentally an issue in alignment of incentives. So the problem is that critical open source projects that we don't have a sustainable way to maintain them. And I'm not talking about contributing back, I'm not talking about uh, integrating a new feature or anything like that. I'm talking about the grunt work of going through the issue tracker every morning and say no, 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 no. <laughs> which I guess is uh, tinged by what I do, which is cryptography, which most of the times I want to tell you no about. And if I said no to anybody in this room uh, on the issue tracker, I'm sorry, you can find me later. Uh, <laughs> but the point is that that work is really hard to fund, both in the volunteerism. 
okay. Uh, in the voluntarism uh, model and in the um, full-time employment model. So what did I do? Well, I had this hypothesis that there was a way to, mm, to fund open source maintenance like a profession. And the model goes a bit like this, the, going to companies and offering them retainers. Uh, the, making the core focus maintenance, so not going to companies and say uh, you'll get 100 hours of support uh, this year. That doesn't scale. Uh, I'm not talking about, hey, do you really want that feature? Uh, I'll implement it for uh, XK. That, that's actually kind of, I'm super uncomfortable with that because that means that to make money, you need to add features. If you add features, you increase maintenance burden. If you increase maintenance burden, you need more money. So what do you do? You add more features, and yeah, that, that, that's a bad spiral. You don't want to be in that spiral. Uh, then there's also uh, applying for grants, which is a totally valid way to, um, to go about it, but then you become an expert in applying for grants, and hey, I, I made a lot of questionable life choices. I just didn't make that one questionable life choice. <clears throat> so this is the part where people tell me, yeah, but Filippo, companies really don't want to pay for this. So really no way to go, uh, to go about it. That was the part that I was convinced was not true. I was convinced that companies can get something out of this because some companies even have an internal Go team whose only job is being experts in Go. Now, that costs so much money. A fully loaded software engineer is like a giant expense. Uh, so my, uh, my theory was that I could go to these companies and say, hey, do you want a resident Go expert that you can ask uh, advice to and who can liaison your uh, issues with the uh, team and can help you guide through the contribution process uh, and so on? And to be clear, this is not offering governance, this is not offering support hours, this, this is just, would you like uh, expertise that you don't currently have access to it? And, you know, I, a lot of people told me, no, that's not gonna work. I was kind of conv conv convinced it would work, so I quit and tried. Uh, and here I want to make a small parenthesis. This is an incredibly privileged thing to do. Uh, I was able to do this because I had the money from having worked at Google to, uh, because I live in a country with a mm, sane healthcare system. Uh, and <laughs> yes, uh, and because of my personal position and because I knew that I could actually call up a number of people and say, hey, would you give me a half an hour of your time? I want to pitch you something. And we'll get to that. Anyway, this is almost exactly a year ago, which I did not realize until I made the slides. I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, so exactly a year ago, I, uh, I announced that this is what I was gonna do. At this time, I had one, I think one client. So, you know, think it until you make it. Uh, if you want to read more about the, the model, and this was the 10 minutes version, but if you want uh, to, to know more, that's a, an article you can find, you know, search engines sort of still work, so uh, I, I'm sure you can find it. Now, a year has passed, so this is an update talk. Um, lots of people ask me, okay, so how is it going? And to be fair, I haven't published much because there's a lot of work involved in doing this thing. Now, first, the good news. It's working. I have a healthy uh, portfolio of clients. Uh, so far, only one client has churned, and not because they were per unhappy about the, the service, but for uh, their side uh, reasons. And I am fairly happy with this, and this is funding me at the same level as Google was funding me, which I'm not saying as a humble brag. I'm saying it because I think it's important that we offer an alternative uh, for maintainers that is competitive with the jobs they could get on the market. Because another thing that doesn't work is saying, well, you're an open source maintainer, right? So you consume, what, three boxes of RAM in a day. Uh, I guess you should go to the cinema a couple times a, a month. So you're gonna be fine with like 10K a year, right? 15 maybe, and you can keep maintaining this. Great, yeah, sounds good. And then, you know, something happens in their life and they go like, well, maybe I would like to make more money than that. And let's see how much money they offer me down the street to a person who can manage a large technical project with a number of stakeholders and uh, who can coordinate contributors and who then qualifies as a software, as a senior software engineer. The answer is a lot more money. 
And so they stop maintaining the open source project. And so again, we don't have a sustainable model. So I think it's important to stress that what I'm going for is something that's competitive with senior software engineer salaries. And that's a part of that everybody usually would just kick me out of the room when I would get to because they would say, there's no way to make that much. So it turns out, yeah. Now, uh, lessons learned. Uh, what, what, what got me um, here? So, a lot of it is sales. This is the bad news part of the talk. Uh, none of us wants to be doing sales. We want to be doing software uh, maintenance. But what I usually tell maintainers on this is, so do you know dentists? Have, do you have a dentist friend, a dentist relative? Do you think they ever stopped for a moment and went like, you know, I really like teeth. But the whole invoicing people, running a clinic, hiring somebody, paying taxes, marketing my services, nah, that, that, that's, that's not my core skill. You know what? I'll just do it for free. <laughs> know anybody? Great. A and anybody who went like, yeah, so you know, really, I'm probably not cut for being a dentist. I guess I'll just change careers. Probably somebody, but most of the dentists we do go to just do the parts of the job that are not core skills. And eh. um, we'll also get to the advantages dentists have over professional maintainers, but we'll get to that in a second. But a core point here is that there's a lot of sales. So it's enterprise sales. There are books about it. Um, we usually like learning stuff, right, when it's technical. Turns out this stuff is also extremely learnable. Uh, and what worked for me is finding champions inside companies uh, and going to them and saying, hey, so this is a thing I'm doing. And those champions are usually engineering. And they'll tell me, oh, that's great. Like, I want that to work, partially because I could see myself maybe at some point doing that. But to be clear, they don't let me spend money around here. And then tell me, yeah, I know, but you know the people who do, and you can introduce me, and so if you can do that, I would appreciate it. And then when those people ghost you, you go back to an engineer, and you're like, hey, how's, uh, how's everything? Uh, and they ask, oh, so how's the conversation with, uh, with John going? Yeah, you know, he seems busy, but if you could just ping him internally, that would be great. And then you do this over and over and over and over and over again, and is it great? No. Does it work? Yeah, yeah. Like, every startup in the world just goes like this. It's, uh, uh, the, the close, uh, however, the closings that did work did not take forever, did not take a year. They either closed in a month or two, or I am still trying to close them right now. I am thinking about one person in particular who's a friend and who I'm still <laughs> chasing. Uh, he got, anyway, the point is, uh, <laughs> uh, point, point is, uh, the, the ones where it will happen, happen soon, otherwise. Um, what, what I'm offering companies has refined a bit. Uh, most uh, companies want the whole thing. I started with like t uh, tiers uh, and like you can get the advisory part and uh, joining, I will join your Slack and nobody bought the lower ones. Which, hey, okay. Great, more money. Uh, at the same time, I feel like I'm leaving something on the table by not knowing how to sell the lower tiers, but whatever, fine. Uh, maybe th the answer is that the thing that does sell is that advisor part I was telling you about earlier. They, when you compare it to, look, you could hire an engineer and have them become an expert in this and have them get involved with the project so that you can go and ask them for support when you need to, or I cost, I cost a fraction of that because I have multiple clients, right? Also, there's not as much risk that I will just move on, um, you know, quit, and you'll have to retrain from scratch. I'm, I come pre-trained in the box. Uh, <clears throat> so that, that's the part that, that, re that really sells. And finally, the ongoing, I was a little worried, am I overcommitting? I started slow because I didn't want to sell time I didn't have. Turns out, my main problem is that some clients don't use enough of my time. So I'm worried that in a year they'll be like, what do you do for us again? <laughs> Which is not a great conversation to have. So I try to keep them engaged and remind them that, hey, you can ask me questions. When I remind them, then they come back with questions and then I answer them and then they're happy and that's great. But sometimes you have to 
rema uh, remind them. Uh, on that, something useful I do is that every time there's a Go release, I'll send a PDF being like, hey, this release happened. You should probably patch. Here's my opinion on what you should patch. Hmm? Uh, a lot of this is sending PDFs. Uh, if you are hoping for you know, the new platform where you register and you get microtransactions directly to your wallet or something, no, I'm here to suggest getting very good at Microsoft Word. <laughs> it doesn't have to be Microsoft Word. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Uh, and finally, it's a multi-stakeholder job. Uh, what does that mean? Sometimes your client will be like, oh, it would be very nice if there was support for foo and cooks and blacks and, and all of that in the standard library. And I'm like... <laughs> no, absolutely not. And, you know, that's a little throat because... <laughs> and for that, it's important to spread out enough that a single client is not so critical that your palms are sweating when uh, you tell them no on something. And it's important to communicate with the rest of the team so that they know your conflict of interest. And I try to recuse myself from all of the proposals, for example, that I help the clients bring. So if a client really wants to propose something, I'll go, uh, tell them, look, what I can do for you is help you present it in a way that makes your case. I'll help you craft the, the proposal. I'll tell you what you should fix. Uh, and then I'll just step back and let the proposal committee uh, decide. That works. Anyway. Uh, a few words on where this is going next, because this is uh, what um, would work so far. Uh, but really, I'm not in this to fund myself, because if I wanted that, to do that, I could have stayed at Google. They have great insurance plans. It's, uh, it's, it's a job. It's fine. Uh, I, I could have stayed. So I left because I wanted to make this into a model that can be replicated. So there's two ways, really, to grow it. One is vertically. I can hire more people and then get them funded, and that's a few more people that do this. And that's kind of un uh, unsatisfactory. Sure, it might make me more money, but it can't grow that much uh, as just Filippo's thing. Uh, which, by the way, this is happening. Uh, I've hired the maintainer of SFTP Go to uh, maintain Xcrypto SSH, which didn't have a maintainer for years. And that's only possible because clients pay enough and they're interested in the SSH package. And so I can go back to clients and say, hey, look at that package that you had a fork. You don't need a fork anymore. That's because you're paying me money. ROI. Woo. Uh, don't cancel, please. <clears throat> but the thing I re I'm really interested in is growing this horizontally. So getting other people to start it. And I'm not talking about starting a platform. And, uh, no, no, no. I'm talking about getting other people to say, all right. Maybe I can do that and try their own version of that. And here's where we get to the, the disclaimers part. Uh, this worked because I have a network. This worked because I had already a public profile. I want, that, I want to fix that slowly and over time. What I want to do is uh, to, to speak about this to enough people and to do this with enough companies that companies get a little more comfortable with it. So that the sale is not anymore, so here's a whole new thing. Let me convince you it's not silly. And then let me convince you to pay me for it. Hopefully you can skip the first part and get to a company who's like, oh yeah, right, we, we do that with a couple of people. Maybe, yeah, that, your project is also, is also useful. Uh, another disclaimer, this is for critical open source projects. Um, I am targeting a very specific kind of open source project. So if this sounds like it wouldn't work for your project, there are two options. It either um, you might uh, uh, be surprised that it's actually easier than it looks, or you might be correct because it's not the right shape of project. The right shape of project is something that's critical to at least a few companies. And that doesn't mean something gigantic like Go. Critical just means that how I pitch it is how long would it take to replace this if you had to. If, and then you let them think about it for a moment and they will go like, uh, two or three engineer years and uh, that's a lot of money. And, uh, and, and then you go like, great, so you would like this to stay maintained. Excellent. Then that's the kind of project that I think you can pitch this, uh, this model for. And so that's the lowering the bar uh, to access. Uh, I like to think that I started because I have more of a public profile and uh, more willingness to wear a button-down shirt and talk fast, um, <laughs> which is very useful for sales. 
Uh, but I would like this to become something that more and more people uh, can do as it expands. So maybe the next uh, cohort of people who do this uh, already have a bit of network, but will have something to start from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then I want to uh, build together the tools to make this uh, easier because I am sort of yoloing stuff like contracts and what works and what doesn't. I'm hoping to build training and um, contract clauses that are easy to uh, pass to legal and say, yeah, so, you know, no, you can't put a complete um, IP assignment clause in that contract because I don't work only for you, so no, I can't give you the rights to everything I write. We will have to have a conversation about that, so stuff like that. And maybe one day uh, making a professional association around it so that uh, it, we can even tackle things like how do you get healthcare in the US, which uh, some freelancer unions give you access to. Anyway, this is how it started, the, how uh, it's been going for the past year, and where I'm trying to take it from now. Uh, the goal is to, make, uh, to, make, to give the option to maintainers to follow it as a profession just like dentists can, starting at junior and ramping their way up using uh, resources that, uh, for learning and support from technical tools. Because that's the th main thing that I think makes it easier for dentists to run clinics than uh, open source maintainers to run businesses. It's that you can buy so much support as a dentist. You can buy books and trainings and CRM software and software to run the clinic that prints the invoice already with like the little teeth uh, drawn uh, on them. And all of that is actually extremely useful. We are starting from scratch here because for some reason, for some beautiful reason, which is why we're all here really, uh, open source didn't start as a profession. It started as hacking. It started as something we wanted to give to the world. But it's now critical infrastructure, and we need some people to make a living and a profession out of it. To be clear, this is not the only way to do things. I'm not here to tell you every single one of you has to get a button down and a 24-hour briefcase and start going out there and closing some deals. No. But I want that to be an option for the projects that need it and for the people that want it. Questions, please. Hi, Filippo. Uh, I know you've been uh, sharing this path for at least half a year, more. Uh, so how many people have followed your advice? Do you, do you know about and uh, how many of them you would say succeeded? Which share of the followers have succeeded? Um, <clears throat> so I've been actually extremely um, skittish to ask people to start trying this until very recently. Partially because until I knew that it worked for me, I was very uncomfortable with telling anybody, go for it, because... Eh. Um, so, really, I've started uh, trying to form a community around this in the last two, three uh, months. Uh, and there are maybe half a dozen people who are aiming for this or angling for, for this. Uh, some of them already were going for something similar. I had at least one conversation where I was like, ha, that, yes. Aha, we, we kept saying things and just m matching notes, and it was great. Um, I think it's too soon to say how many of those are successful. I'm barely comfortable saying that I'm being su successful because it's been a year, and after a year, I'm a little more, whew, people are not canceling after the first year. Great. Uh, but it's a little too soon to say how many are successful, I think. If anybody wants to try, now is the time though to email me because I want to set up a bit of a community. I don't know if it's going to be, I don't know, Matrix Rooms, Slack, uh, uh, mailing list, something to compare notes, share tools. So now's the time. Um, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, how do you see this interaction? I imagine it being a little bit of a potential problem with uh, open source projects that are grown from or that are already have companies crystallized around them. So there's a, like a bit of a tension there with this kind of freelance model that you're uh, pitching. So governance in open source is complicated and you know it's a people's job and I think all, every maintainer is actually very expert in negotiation already because some of it is uh, figuring out diverging incentives. Um, I think this would probably be in contrast with uh, open source uh, projects that have a company built around offering support contracts. But 
that company probably already scales with the success of the project, so it's not probably suffering in the same way I was describing. If the users double, the potential support contracts double. Support contracts have, a pro have their own problems, which is why I'm not going for that. Uh, but maybe I wouldn't start by cannibalizing a project that has already a scalable um, uh, funding model. But um, projects that instead have mostly uh, companies that are footing the bill but are not reselling support hours, they're not built around, we are the open source project X and you can pay us for the open source project X, I don't think this is actually in contrast. Um, <clears throat> case in point, I don't think anybody at Google resents me for doing this. Actually, they are happy that now there's uh, two maintainers uh, on top of the headcount they have uh, maintaining, uh, maintaining Go. Mm. It, it's, so far, there's been no, no issue for, uh, with that kind of um, company uh, involvement. Thank you. Thank you, Filippo, for a very inspiring talk. Uh, do you have any suggestions or advice for people who already went to the dark side and truly really don't have a means to get back to the ramen, uh, say, level of uh, money for a couple of years to just get back to the being a critical maintainer to start pitching projects? I am s sorry, I did not catch that partial. There was some noise. Yeah, so uh, uh, if you are already at the dark side and we already cannot get back to the, well, uh, open source uh, uh, ramen, ramen level of income to get back into the critical maintainer path because you know your kids not go, not going to like it, your wife not going to like it, your bank with uh, your uh, with your uh, with your, your your house is not going to like it. Uh, so what do we do now? Uh, we are already in a, in a company somewhere. We are not doing the maintenance because we had to get out of this past uh, long long time ago, and we would like to get uh, get into it back now. Do we have any way to pitch it really? Because uh, saying that, okay, you know what, 10 years ago I was maintaining this thing, and maybe you could hire me again, though 10 years I was not doing anything, it doesn't, li doesn't sound like something convincing. Okay, so the question was, um, if I understand it correctly, how, <clears throat> how do you get uh, back into the maintenance uh, track if you are um, doing other ways of uh, doing uh, software development as a professional? Yes? Um, okay, so I think that gets to the general question of what is the ra uh, ramp up uh, to what I'm describing. Because I just skipped, right? I uh, went like, well, great, 5,000 people off my newsletter. Here's a new thing. And great, that's not a, that's not a on ramp. Uh, so the on ramps will be part of what we need to figure out as this uh, matures. Uh, because I think they, w they can look like um, getting involved with a maintainer who's already doing this. For, for example, if I'm already doing this with Go and somebody uh, is mm, a skilled in Go and something that my clients specifically need, uh, I can hire them, they can start uh, doing that um, through my contracts so they don't need their own uh, cache and, that, um, and then they can use uh, that to maybe sp spin off into their own thing, which is really how uh, firms uh, work, uh, how lawyers uh, get started, uh, how um, security consultancies got started in the 90s and early olds. Uh, if you look at that history, uh, you'll see that they started as individual mm, realities pretty much like mine based on uh, the, mm, the popularity of the individual, then they grew and then they spun off pieces and then it became an industry. And now you can just be a junior security analyst, right? I, I'm hoping one day uh, one on ramp will be just starting as a junior maintainer on a team and then uh, spinning off. And that, I think, is one on-ramp. We should definitely figure out different ones and ways to pre-invest so that you don't have to jump and say, I will not make no money for six months, and then hopefully I will start making a little money. Um, we, will, uh, we need to figure out ways to get investment up front for, um, for some projects, and I think the more companies get comfortable with this and with the fact that they want this, because they do. Like, the real thing that surprised me is that companies are, are oftentimes like, yeah, yeah, okay, that, great. We are uncomfortable about our open source supply chain. So as companies get there, hopefully we'll get to a, a place where you can get a pre-commitment letter, which is often how product, products uh, on-ramp. 
uh, and then once you have three letters, you go like, okay, I'm ready to make the jump. If anyone needs a freelancer Go maintainer for the dev rooms, uh, I'm available, uh, call me. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan Rebrowse.